know, I've, I've been sitting here uh, for two days now and listening to some really brilliant talks, and I keep rewriting and making notes to the point where what I wanted to tell you was rather useless almost. I have to start with a story um, to establish my own credibility in some way. So I want to share a story. Uh, for three years, I taught at Harvard, three and a half years. And uh, we had an extraordinary uh, group of, I had an extraordinary group of students, uh, including one uh, study group that was, that had 29 uh, of the most extraordinary people I've ever met. One of them is actually here with me today. The, um, at any event, they came to me at one point, some of the women in the group, and they said that there was uh, someone they wanted me to talk to because he was a pig. And, um, and they wanted me to talk him out of what he was doing. And what he was doing, and I'm gonna try to describe this family friendly, is he would put up two pictures of two co-eds. And he would say, who would you rather go to bed with? He had a cruder way of putting it. Who would you rather go to bed with, this one or this one? And then people would vote, and after a while he'd say, well, all right, this one won. So we changed this picture. Now who would you rather go to bed with? And he went on and on, and they thought this was incredibly sexist and disgusting, and it had to stop. After all, this was Harvard. So I called uh, this student, and Mark Zuckerberg came to see me. <laughs> and uh, I tried to talk him out of doing this stupid thing, of, uh, which I guess turned into Facebook. So I'm, I've got the... Uh, the thrilling reputation of being the person who tried to talk Mark Zuckerberg out of doing Facebook because <laughs> it was such a uh, really terrible idea. Um, so that's my bona fides. So if I have an opinion on something, you'll be able to weigh it a little better. Um, what I found listening to all the really wonderful talks that I've heard today and in the conversations that we had yesterday this really a battle between technology and content. Not a battle, but a way to find a good marriage between content and technology. And I find you're wonderful when it comes to technology. That there's probably no issue you can't solve with your genius on how to reach people, measure people, weigh people, figure out you know, why they turn left on a Thursday at 3 p.m. to get to the Starbucks and how they do, what they order and all that kind of stuff. But I think you have some problems when it comes to content. I think that um, it's fine. I think what Holly's doing is terrific, and that's content um, that is certainly useful for people, but it is not as valuable the kind of content as people have when they find it themselves, when it's really about their lives, when it's really what they consider to be real and not manufactured for them. I think there's a credibility, a serious credibility problem exists between consumers and all of us because there's just an air of distrust in the world kind of right now. We've spent a lot of time in my business trying to figure out what kind of content is really really important to people. You know, you're selling a product, and when I was doing, and in my news years, of which there were 40, um, I was selling a product too, but my product was something where I had to try to make what's going on in Syria interesting and important for people who could probably give a damn. The issue with people uh, when we would deal with news would be, what is it that they want to know versus what is it that they need to know that they don't even know they need to know? And we had problems dealing with it that way. We tried, <coughs> excuse me, all kinds of interesting ways. We'd look for, for, for ways to hook in. Um, I did a show once, and, uh, and it's amazing how people find this information and move quickly. Well, I did a show once, and our, my anchor woman, a very well-known person whose identity I will protect, had this earring, you know, these earrings, these beautiful dangle earrings, and one of her earrings just fell off <coughs> right in the middle of the show. And when we looked later at the Nielsen ratings, the ratings at 
immediately upon that earring hitting her lap, skyrocketed. I don't know how people found out about it, but they came and they watched the end of our show, and it was one of the higher rated shows. And so we sat, as any good marketer would sit, and we decided, well, what if she lost every day either a piece of jewelry or <laughs> what if some, some piece of clothing came off or something? We, we didn't think we could sustain that without all getting arrested um, or her really losing her reputation. Um, so it didn't quite work, but we were always, were always looking for ways to catch on. Now what happens is you see something work, you see something work in business and you copy it. There's a MasterCard ad going right now which uses Justin Timberlake and it's very clever and I think it catches on and I'll bet I'll see 50 of them before the end of the year because copying is what we do. You see a television program and it resonates with the public and then the next season you see 10 more just like that because it's easier to copy and hope that you hit than to perhaps come, with, come up with something new and yet that's what people really look for. If you really want to connect with viewers, users, whatever, consumers, whatever you call them, you really have to find something that's different and new. You have to kind of be first in with, with, uh, with that kind of work. I, I told a story yesterday. How many of you watch Mad Men? A lot of people, a lot of you? Did you, did you see the episode with the Defenders in it? Anybody? Well, you're cheating. <laughs> the, um, there was a show in the 60s called The Defenders. It starred E.G. Marshall. It was about these lawyers, brave lawyers. It, it led to a thousand other legal programs that followed L.A. Law and all the rest of that. And they had a mistake in, in, uh, happened to them, or a, a disaster happened to them one week. The, uh, the show they were doing for that week, because they used to work on a tight frame, was destroyed in its processing. And so they didn't have a show. Well, they had 35 million viewers. You can't all of a sudden say the Defenders will not be seen this week because we lost the show in the soup. I don't think people would understand that. Now, they had one other show that they had been playing with because they thought it was controversial. And, and it was the only show that they actually had that was done and it was a show about abortion. Now this is before Roe v. Wade. This is at a time when Lucille Ball was not pregnant. They never said what she was, she just kept getting bigger and eventually she had a child. This was at a time when Rob and Laura Petrie lived, slept in twin beds. So you know just how puritanical television was at this time. So here we have the only episode of The Defenders we have has got the word abortion in it 89 times in the dialogue. And it's a girl who's suing her parents. She wants an abortion. They're all illegal at this time. She wants an abortion. Her parents won't let her do it. And she's suing in court. Well, they tell the advertising community, here's what we're doing this week, and everybody <clears throat> drops out. Nobody wants any part of it. It was like trying to get an advertiser during the Gulf War, even when we went to Hewlett Packard and said, you know, you can do commercials that talk about how you're saving American soldiers' lives with your technology. Nobody wants to be connected to a war. Well, nobody wants to be connected to a show about abortion. Um, one company, one little tiny company, but they had to sell it, by the way. They had to sell ads because it has to fill an hour. There were only 48 minutes of programs. They had 12 minutes of ads that they had to sell, or what do you do? you know, for the other 12 minutes. So they had a fire sale. This was, uh, they, they offered commercials for $1,000 a minute. I think even less in some cases. This is for 35 million American viewers or more. This is ridiculous. This is like, this is giving it away. And one company, which no one had ever heard of, bought an enormous amount of commercial time. They bought like you know, $8,000 worth of minutes, $8,000 worth of minutes. And at the end of the show, they had 
35 million eyeballs had watched their ad, and it gave birth to Revlon. A guy took a shot, took a chance, and it paid off. There aren't a lot of those great payoffs anymore, but it shows you that when something is new, when something is different, when something is prevent by the way, they had no complaints about the program either. You know, they expected this raft of irate viewers, how can you talk about abortion? Apparently the network got very little uh, comment from the viewers. So this was somebody who took a chance and it paid off. And I think today what we've got is an audience that's searching for things that are new, stories that are new, stories that don't have them feeling handled, but are relevant to them. Now, that's a tough balance. It's a tough way to go. We, I work on a show called Newsroom. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> and, and I'm sure Aaron Sorkin thanks you <laughs> as, as well. The, um, he really is the, it's his show. I mean, everything that we do, we compare, we write lots of script. And at the end of a week, we all sit there and say, all right, how many of your words did he use? And how many of my words did he use? And he's just, he's quite a brilliant person. HBO is an, uh, an interesting network. And I think it tells us something about what's happening to television. You know, there's so much to tell you in so little time. So I have no idea where I am in time. And I'll try to get done in 10 minutes and leave a lot to, to later. But HBO, I think, gives us an idea of where television is going. Because I don't think commercial television, broadcast television, or cable television has a prayer to exist in its current form in another five years or so. Um, you get some networks that are staples on a lot of cable tiers, but they have no viewers. There aren't, a, there aren't a million people watching all of the cables put together, news cables put together in the course of a day, not a million in, during the day. In prime time, shows are huge hits, with the exception of O'Reilly, all the other shows get a million and a half or less viewers. In the old days, they used to, some of you may remember this, they used to feed color bars after sign off, you know, at 2 a.m., and some people would get up and they'd tune their color TV to the color bars and all the rest. That had 4 million viewers. <laughs> color bars had 4 million viewers. Programming has less. What you, have, what you see happening on cable right now in news is people screaming at each other, and, they, and it's really good. You know, those Democrats on MSNBC are shoving it to the Republicans, and those of course, independent people who uh, we report, you would decide. On Fox, I'm, I'm not going to call them Republican, but those Republican bastards are handing it to the Democrats. And then CNN is lost and doesn't know really what it's doing, so it's kind of a little of both. And, and they're all pretty disappointing. But at some point, cable channels, cable networks, are going to take a look and say, you know, we give ESPN $9 an eyeball for putting them on our tier, $9. And if, C and, if, and if ESPN wasn't on our cable tier, you wouldn't buy it. You wouldn't buy the tier. CNN, we give them whatever we give them, 50 cents a dollar. I used to, when I was president, we used to get a half a billion dollars in January from the cable users or across the year, a half a billion dollars in usage fees. But their ratings are low. And as they start to get judged, a lot of those contracts are going to change, and they're going to lose a lot of that revenue. You have Al Jazeera just gave Al Gore a windfall, of, and they've spent close to a billion dollars to build a network. Does anybody have an idea of how many viewers Al Jazeera has as a network? Want to take a guess? Anyone? 12,000. Sometimes they peak at 16,000 viewers, and they've spent a billion dollars. I mean, they could have sent everybody a couple grand and just said, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> here we are. Uh, HBO as a no show on HBO no, really has enough viewers to demand 
what Blacklist or, or Scandal or some of the commercial networks have. But as a totality, people want HBO on their cable because they want to watch Newsroom and they want to watch some of the other shows that are on HBO. So as a network, they're greater. Each, the network itself is greater than the sum of its parts. None of those programs would be successful on their own. But as a totality, they create a marketplace where everybody wants HBO on their tier, and that's what they care about. And so HBO gets $6 an eyeball, something like that. I think what's going to happen is the day where the advertising experts, uh, I've been through some of these lectures, and they sit and they talk to advertisers, our research people at the networks, and they tell them, I understand people have DVRs, but they don't race through your commercial. They watch your commercial, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know anybody who watches commercials. Not if, you've, not if you've delayed it. I mean, the only commercials you watch are on sports shows because generally you watch those live. At some point, advertisers are going to catch on that. Do you really want to spend a quarter of a million dollars for a half a minute on um, one of the you know, comedy shows on CBS counting on people to sit through your commercial when they're clearly not? Are you going to spend the kind of money that you spend, with the exception of things like the Super Bowl and you know, those things where the commercials are alive and people are watching because they have no choice? So I think what ends up happening is I think these networks move into tiers. Um, the challenge for you is to try to figure out how to continue the advertising stream when they're moving to tiers like on HBO and you pay a fee and you get a certain amount of product, and they don't expect all this commercial noise. They expect something different. I think the, the challenge for you is to figure out how to take commercials, how to take the commercial world and move it into the new world, because I think the new world is going to be one where we're into tier broadcasting. We're not in, it's not about televisions. It's about the internet. It's about digital. Um, and how you can make use of that for your clients. As I listen, by the way, and then I'll just finish up very quickly, as I listen, and I, I really think content is what it's, what it's all about. I know you can solve the technology problem, but the content problem is a different one. And um, I think the biggest problem I see is that a lot of companies don't understand what makes them money. I know that sounds silly because they're entrepreneurs. They should know that. But a lot of them, I watch some of their commercials and I watch some of their messages and I'm thinking, do you realize what it is that makes people come to your company? Do you realize what it is that makes your product essential to, for them? Because there's 10 kinds of Levi's, sorry. There's 10 kinds of televisions. There's a million newspapers and, and, and you know, I don't know, 25 different kinds of automobiles. So what is it that differentiates? What is it that you can point out? There's, there's five major credit cards. Why should they buy your credit card or get your credit card and not somebody else's? A lot of people, I think, and maybe you find that in your experience, don't understand what it is that consumers are looking for from them.